straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Political hitmen. I'm Howie Silberger, your political hitman here on Israel News Talk Radio. Normally on this show, I don't, I try, I try not to cover the same stuff that uh, that other shows cover. I try to be a little original and unique in the uh, in the in the stuff that we talk about. But today is going to be a little different, and the reason today is going to be a little different is because there's only one topic we could talk about. And that is the unfortunate, horrific events that happened this, just a few days ago at Maron during Lagba Omer. We have to talk about it. And why do we have to talk about it? Because there is a lot of, uh, of talk happening. I've been reading a lot. I've been watching a lot. I've been hearing a lot. And I've been sickened to my stomach on some of the stuff I've been hearing. And I, I want to talk about... How how sad it is that this happened, but how angry we have to be that this happened. You see, you see, we could be very sad and very angry at the same time. And I'm very sad. I um I, I know the family of uh, of at least one of the people who were killed, and I, I know there are plenty of people who know um who know many of the people who were killed or their families. And I know that this death could have been avoided. These deaths could have been avoided. You know, when it's a terror attack, it's one thing. Terror attack, we could say it's random, it happens, and uh, and there's nothing we could do to stop it. But with this event, there was plenty that could have been done to stop it. There have been many, many years of warnings, of reports, uh, of of discussions about how to avoid a tragedy at at at, at Mount Moron, and they've all been ignored pushed under the table, put there to be a, to appease people. We'll talk about this and a whole lot more. We're live. You could call in. You could join me in the chat room at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. The numbers are on the top of the page on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. I'd love to hear you uh, from you. I'd love to talk to you about this. Uh, we're going to take a little break. Uh, when we come back, I want to uh, I want to discuss how angry I am and how angry you should be. The return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel was prophesied in the Bible thousands of years ago and is coming true today. Shalom. Join me, Josh Wander, on Israel Unplugged. Listen in as we delve into the spiritual and physical aspects of the Jewish return to Zion. We'll discuss the biblically mandated, historic, and of course practical understandings of this incredible transition from exile to redemption. That's Israel Unplugged, every Monday on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Try this Kaba Isakovich. Political hitman. I'm Howie Silberger, your political hitman, right here on Israel News Talk Radio. You could join me in the chat room at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. You could call in. The number is to call in North America, 301-768-4841. In Israel, the number is 0265-00151. So 45 people died uh, celebrating Glad Baomer on, on uh, Mount Moron uh, on, uh, on Thursday night, Friday morning. They died not because a terrorist entered the site and committed some horrific terror attack that did not happen. They weren't taken by God in a golden chariot, as some people have claimed. They weren't punished for the sins of the Jewish people, as other people have claimed. They died due to the negligence of many people. And people should be held accountable 
for their actions, which led to these deaths. Now, it's outrageous that 45 people, mostly teenagers and people in their young 20s, um, had to die in order to be, in order for public safety to be looked at. You have a public event where 100,000 people show up. Safety protocols should be in place. And it was quite apparent that they weren't. Now, there were heroes and there are villains. And in a black and white world, we could say there are heroes, there are villains, and, uh, and we could differentiate between heroes and villains. But in this case here, the heroes were some of the people who died sacrificing their lives to save others. I've heard of at least two or three stories uh, of people in the crowd who, uh, who went to save children, younger children, children saving younger children, who ended up being crushed to death while they saved the lives of others. And these people should be celebrated because uh, they, they were brave. Uh, but as we continue and the news cycle continues, we realize that, as in most cases, we will uh, never remember the names of the dead. Those names seem to fade off into history. And because there's no perpetrator of the crime, there's no, there's no terrorist, we're not going to remember the name of a terrorist. And, that, and, and this whole event in a few weeks will be forgotten by the news cycles. Newspapers will have forgotten it already. It's already on the back pages of newspapers and uh, on the bottom of the websites. And in a day or two, it won't, it won't even appear. And it'll be as if this event didn't happen. And, and that's outrageous. 45 people died because the government didn't do their job. 45 people died because religious leaders didn't do their job. 45 people died because nobody cared. Now, I know it's harsh. It's a harsh thing to say. And I know people are going to get upset with me for saying these things. That nobody cared. Of course people cared. Nobody wanted anyone to die, people are going to argue. And people have argued with me. I've had this conversation a couple of times in the last couple of days. That nobody wanted anybody to die. Chas shalom. God forbid. Anybody should die. Nobody wanted anybody to get hurt. But they wanted to make sure they, that, that there were enough space. They wanted to make sure that enough people came in to celebrate, to make it, uh, to make it a huge celebration at the grave of uh, Rav Shimon ben Yochai. And then disaster happened. And they said disaster could happen anywhere. It's not specific to this event. Disaster could happen anywhere. And, and you can't blame anybody. It was the will of God, they tell me. The will of God. Wow, that's quite a it's quite a statement, if you ask me. Sure, God creates everything, and God uh, and and God decides who who lives and who dies. We 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 understand that. And God makes the decisions on how long we live and what kind of life we live. We understand that. And God also trusts that we are going to protect each other, and we are going to ensure that we don't harm each other or harm ourselves intentionally or unintentionally. That we'll be careful. That we'll watch out for ourselves and for each other. That we will take care of one another. The will of God is one thing. But gross negligence is something else. So, God gave us the freedom of choice. So the will of God is there, but the freedom of choice is there too. For instance, God could have granted me a hundred years to live. And sure, I have that hundred years. I could live that hundred years. And if I take care of myself and I watch myself, I could live a hundred years. But if tomorrow I go to the street and jump in front of a bus, then I'm robbing myself of the years that God gave me. Now, if I'm a bus driver and I have a full bus of people and I drive that bus into a wall and blow the bus up, then I'm robbing everybody else of those years that God gave them. So premature death is something totally unrelated to the will of God. And death by negligence is definitely unrelated to the will of God, even for religious people. 
Now religious people will say, well, the negligence was the will of God. I mean, you know, we, could, we could talk, we could use this circular logic all the time. And, and the deflection from, from assigning blame to people and the deflection from, uh, from, from understanding that this was a completely avoidable situation is sickening to me. Now, some may say I'm a heretic. That's fine. You can, you can, you can call me whatever you want. I'll, I'll call myself what you want to call me. I, I, will, I, will, I will address the issue right away. You could call me a heretic. You could say that I, I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Because for at least 20 years, probably even more, there have been warnings about the Lagorma gathering on Mount Moron. There have been warnings about the size of the crowd. In fact, reports uh, for, for, this, for this year, reports say that, um, that the, initially the public health authorities wanted 9,000 people on the mountain this year. They didn't want more than 9,000 people. And their mind was changed by Arya Derry, the head of Shas. So 100,000 people showed up. That, that's quite a difference, right? 9,000 people, 100,000 people. It's quite a difference in the amount of people. Now, I've listened to interviews of survivors of the, uh, of the crush in the one exit that, that uh, had the problem. And they were quite clear that they were exiting the, the event because there were way too many people there. They felt that the situation was getting out of hand. Even standing there, even standing there, they felt the situation getting out of hand. Now, I know, I know, you can tell me, I know, that every year there's a half a million people that show up on Mount Moron in a space that could theoretically only... ...hold 25,000 people. 500 people, they show up and, uh, and, and, and there's never a tragedy. Nothing ever happens. This is, a, this, is, this is an argument I've heard too. And I know. I know. They were lucky. Lucky for so many years that nothing like this has happened before. Very, very lucky. It doesn't mean that it was right. There's a concept in Judaism, a concept that we have to, uh, that we have to discuss. The concept is called saving people's lives. Called pekuach nefesh, protecting life. This concept means that, uh, that when you have a situation where, uh, where a life is in danger, it's your obligation to, to, to save that life. And, uh, and, and, and it's your obligation to do it. That, that's it. You have to save life. We have to do whatever we could do to save somebody's life. The, uh, the organizers of this event, the, the religious leaders that were running the events, the government officials that had to green light the event, especially during this COVID year where everything is being restricted, the people in charge went to inspect the site. We know this because they tell us that they went to inspect the site. The exit that caused the problem that, that these people died in was a relatively newly constructed exit. And there, there were warning signs that were put up. They, 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 um, they didn't put the physical signs. They, there were warning signs before the event. They, they, they were talking about how dangerous this exit was and how maybe it's not built properly and how maybe, maybe, uh, maybe it could be a danger. But then they ignored their own warnings. The controller had a report. They ignored their report. So one has to wonder, who could be held responsible for this event, for, for, for these deaths? Who could be held responsible for the lives of the 45 people? Who should be held responsible? That's, that's the question. Do we hold religious leaders responsible because they didn't ensure that all these exits were safe? But then you could say the religious leaders were relying on the government and, and the police to ensure that all the exits were safe. Could you blame the police for not for not controlling the crowd, but I mean, if it was an overflow crowd, perhaps, maybe, they were stuck. Who do you blame? Give me a call. In North America, 301-768-4841. In Israel, 0265-00151. You can join me in the chat room 
on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Who should be held accountable for the disaster, for the, for, the, for the deaths of 45 people, mostly children, at Mount Moron? Who should be held responsible for this? When we uh, come back from the, from the break, I want to, uh, I want to talk about, um, about two specific stories that, uh, that, that, that came up over the last week of people in the crowd who tried to help, who, uh, who, who died helping other people. Talk about that when we come back from the break. I'm Howie Soberger. This is Political Hit- Hitman on Israel News Talk Radio. Give me a call. We're live. Hi, everyone. This is Andrea Simington from Jerusalem inviting you to drop everything and join me on my show, Pull Up a Chair. We'll visit this week's quirky stories, meet fabulous guests, and discover my Israel. Together, we'll laugh, shout, and explain the topics that make us say, hey, we've got to talk about that. So get comfortable and pull up a chair with me, Andrea Simington, every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. Political hitman. I'm Howie Silberger, your political hitman, right here on Israel News Talk Radio. So, who are we going to blame? Who who should be blamed for the for the deaths of 45 people at Mount Moron on uh, Lag Bomer? Who should be blamed? Um, I'm 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 leaning towards the politicians more than the police. Uh, if the story is true that uh, Arya Derry um, changed the the public health um, recommendations and allowed a hundred thousand people rather than nine thousand people there, I mean maybe he should be blamed a little bit. I, I know there were half a million people there last year and two years ago and three years ago and they never had a problem. And for the last, you know, who knows how many years, there have been hundreds of thousands of people who have gone there. It always takes somebody getting hurt to, 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 for people to take a look and say, hey, wait a second, there's something wrong here. It always takes some kind of crazy experience, something to happen, before people finally say, hey, um, okay, we have to take a look and we have to, we have to fix something. It's very unfortunate. You don't get an uh, alarm system until you get robbed. You don't buy insurance until something happens. So, uh, so th- now that now that we have uh, forty five deaths, forty five dead people, maybe it's time to uh, to take a look at the situation and say, maybe a hundred thousand p- people in a uh, in an area that's supposed to that, that could hold maximum twenty five thousand people is 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 a crazy thing to do. Maybe five hundred thousand people in that same area is even crazier. Maybe it's time to start taking a look and try, you know, maybe, maybe try to save lives in the future. So now I know for sure, I know 100% that the exit that this problem happened is going to be demolished. They're going to rebuild it and they're going to say it's safe. Take a look how safe it is. They're going to do that. I know that. And I know that uh, uh, for 100% that, uh, that uh, there'll be an inquiry and they'll find, um, and they'll find that, 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 the problem wasn't really with the administration it wasn't really with the police the problem was more with um with, with people slipping on this uh, on this ramp on the slippery ramp and that's what caused the disaster and so nobody will be held accountable and everybody will go home and sleep except for these 45 people and their families will suffer well the 45 people are dead and their families will suffer forever that um that we know that we know is going to happen i mean that's what happens in most countries in cases like this that's what happens. So there are two stories that stuck out to me that stood out to me for um, uh, of of people who died in the event, who died trying to save other people. Uh, one of those stories was uh, was was a school teacher who, who had come with uh, with a couple of his with a student and his son, and um, and and he had lost his uh, he had lost the um, he had lost control of his kids. His kids had been separated from him, and unfortunately, they both died. And um, and and he uh, and, and he was he was offered to be pulled out of the crowd, and he he said, "No, no, not me. Take the kids." And, and he pushed some kids there to uh, to be pulled out of the crowd. Uh, 
Now, that doesn't seem very heroic when you think about it on a, on a small scale. But on a large scale, when you know that people are dying and he, he put his life in danger to save other people. And uh, there were two stories like that. There was one story where he survived and one story where, where, where the guy died. Uh, when, you, when you think that these people put their lives on the line to save other people, knowing that other people were being crushed and suffocating to death, th- these are heroes. And they should be celebrated as heroes. There were two yeshiva boys. And I heard it. Uh, I heard it today. Um, it was at um, it was at one of the shiva houses. I heard. I heard the story. And in fact, it was reflected on the other side, uh, at another shiva house. Uh, I heard the same story on two different shiva houses. Uh, the story was that these two yeshiva boys were were standing there, and there was a eight year old boy who was suffocating. He was. He was. He couldn't breathe. Uh, there were too many people closed in on him, and he, he really just he was being crushed and he was being suffocated. And these boys shielded this eight-year-old boy with their bodies. They they got around him and they they made um, they made kind of a tent with their arms and shielded this uh, this eight-year-old boy with their bodies. And the eight-year-old boy survived. His father uh, his father's legs were broken, but he, uh, his father survived and he survived. But the two yeshiva boys were killed. The twenty-one-year-old boy and the and a, and, a, and a seventeen-year-old boy. They were killed. And 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 you think about death by heroism. Sacrificing yourself to save somebody else. And when we talk about this concept of saving others' lives, this is the ultimate way to do it. To sacrifice yourself to save somebody else is the ultimate way to do it. You, you, can't, you can't do things that are, that, are, that are greater than that. And to die a hero is, is amazing. Um, I prefer not to die a hero, to be honest. And I prefer if nobody died a hero. But if you're going out, that's the way to go out, to saving somebody else. But they should have never been in this position to start with. This should never have happened. Religious leaders should have encouraged less people to come to the event. 500,000 people on a normal basis was way too much and everybody knew it. 100,000 people at the event was way too much and everybody knew it. So either the religious leaders should have had shifts and then different, different times for people to come and go. Or, or they, there should have just been a limit. So religious leaders are partly to blame because they just stood, they stood there and they, and they encouraged more and more people to come to the event. Which, by the way, is traditional. It's a traditional event. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a religious event. It's not, a, it's not an event that, uh, that is uh, prescribed by, uh, by religious law. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a traditional event that happens every year. It's 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 more of a spiritual event than a religious event. So the uh, the religious leaders that encourage so many people to come should be held accountable. Uh, they should be held accountable because it's it's pretty negligent, and the danger is always lurking there. The government it should definitely be held accountable for this. They had uh, reports going back at least fifteen years saying that the events at Mount Moron. We're dangerous, and that eventually something's going to happen, and somebody's going to get hurt. And those those reports, year after year, were filed away, as reports tend to be, put away, and um, and not not uh, not heard from again. So here we are. This has happened, and where do we go from here? And that's the question everyone's asking. Where do you go from here? Do you hold an event like this again next year? Do you cancel the event and say, listen, okay, we, we, have a, we had a tragedy, and, uh, and so we're not going to do this anymore? Do you, uh, do you alter the event and allow less people to come? What do you do? How do you, how do you fix the problem? Now, for the 45 people and their families, the problem could never be fixed. This is a permanent problem. These people are gone. Children have lost their parents. Parents have lost their children. Grandchildren have lost their grandparents. Students have lost their teachers and their classmates. The ripple effect of the death of these 45 people is large. The people affected, there's a lot of people affected. The sadness is, is great and people affected all over the world. And the sadness is great around the world. 
But level heads must prevail at the end. And emotions, as, as strong as they are and as, 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 as horrific as they are, must be put aside and practicality must be looked at. And while it is not important, absolutely not important, to pose blame, although, although for closure, and to ensure that these things don't happen again, blame, at least against the, the authorities that were, um, that were responsible for this, should be, should be placed. Uh, we, we as a people have to heal and we have to move on, of course, and we will, because we always do. But we must move on smarter. We must move on better. We must use this tragedy to better the system, to make the system better. We must use this tragedy, we must learn from this tragedy to ensure that nothing like this ever happens again. This is the, this is the worst civilian tragedy in Israel in the history of the country. So we, we don't want to repeat this. We don't want, we don't want to repeat of this. Now, going overboard, and this is what it tends to happen too, it either goes two ways. That it gets brushed under the carpet and everyone forgets about it in a couple of weeks and we move on to something else. Or they go overboard with regulations and, and craziness. That's, that's, that's a possibility too that happens. Going overboard probably is not the, uh, the best option. But not doing anything is not the option either. So a balanced approach to how to react to this on a political level rather than an emotional level has to be fostered. Anger can't factor into it. Sadness can't factor into it. One has to look practically at the situation and say, okay, the politicians failed. The police failed. Religious leaders failed. The failure led to the death of 45 people. How do we change things to make it better? And that's what I want to talk about the next segment. How do we change things to make it better? How do we change things on a religious level? How do we change things on the political level and, and on the police level? How, how, how can we change things to make it better? How can we use this tragedy and make it better for other people? Give me a call if you have an idea. Numbers are 301-768-4841 or in Israel, 0265-00151. You could join me in a chat room on israelnewstalkradio.com I'm Howie Silberger, this is Political Hitman Are you interested in transforming your life? drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. Hello, I am Walter Bingham. If you want to hear the news behind the news and the true perspective on world affairs, then the Walter Bingham File is the program for you. We bring you interviews with the movers and shakers, political commentaries, and on-the-spot reports of events as they happen. All here every Tuesday, 4 p.m. Israel Time, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. And it's all archived on our website. Make it a date. Political hitman. I'm Howie Silberger, your political hitman, right here on Israel News Talk Radio. Uh, give me a call in North America. The number is 301 768 4841. In Israel, the number is 0265 so we can't go back in time. We can't go back and change what happened. We can't bring back the people who have died. We can't uh, 
We can't change the situation for the families who have lost loved ones. We can't take away the sorrow and bring back happiness. It's it's not going to happen. It just can't be done. It's unfortunate, but we can't do it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, time goes forward. It doesn't go backwards. So what's happened has happened. Now, um, what I'm uh, what I'm what I'm suggesting. is that we have to learn the lessons from what happened and we have to what we can do is go forward and change the future that's that we can do and so how do we change the future what do we do to change the future what does that mean how do you change the future well to me it is strict regulations uh, now i i'm a law and order kind of guy and i'm the kind of guy who uh, who, who who likes who likes regulations and especially regulations that save lives and regulations that protect people. I, I'm big on that. And so for me, um, I, I think that strict regulations on how many people could come into the event and actually implying, applying those regulations, regardless of the objections of, 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 of the religious fervent fer- 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 people, uh, aside from the objections uh, from anybody, that's, uh, a serious assessment of the area be taken, a serious uh, decision be made on how many people could legally be held there, and then holding people accountable for allowing the illegal amount of people there at any given time. This should be the uh, this should be the focus of the Israeli government after this tragedy. The second thing that should be looked at immediately is the is the uh, safety of the entrances and the exits of the event. So, I mean, I, I've worked in uh, public buildings my whole life. I've, um, I, I've seen building inspections where they come into buildings and they look at buildings and they tell you, okay, this is how things should, should work and this is how, uh, this is how, this is how uh, evacu- you have evacuation plans, you have, uh, you, have, um, you have safety plans, there's all sorts of plans in place for any eventuality. If something happens, there's plans in place. Uh, a safety plan, a safety evacuation plan, has to be put into place for, for an event that has 100,000 or 500,000 people. Uh, if you're going to allow that many people in there, a safety plan must be put into place, and people must be in place to apply and implement the safety plan to ensure that people get out safely if something, God forbid, happens. This is something that must be done. And it didn't seem like it was done in this case. Chaos reigned. If you watch the videos of what happened at Mount Moron, chaos. Chaos. Absolute chaos. And chaos in massive events should never, ever happen. The media was reporting it as a stampede. It wasn't really a stampede. It was more of a crush. It was a, it was a bottleneck. And a bottleneck crush is, is actually worse than a stampede. A stampede... When people start running in one direction, the uh, some people fall and get trampled, and that's one thing. But a bottleneck crush is totally different. Uh, I spoke to uh, some people who were connected to some of the family members of um, of people who were who were killed, and I was told, and I'm just going to share. I was told a lot of things, but uh, some of the things are too gruesome to share, and I'm not going to share them. But the uh, the one thing. That 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 I mean, I'm going to share because because it just it just shows you how horrific this event was, is that some of the bodies that were found at the event were unidentifiable. You you could look at them, and you wouldn't tell who they were. They were so crushed, it was un, they were unidentifiable. Uh, I know of at least two bodies that were that at least two, and there were probably more, but two people that I personally knew or knew the families or people who knew the families uh, were only identifiable through DNA testing. So that shows how much of the crush, how much of a crush this was, how, how, how horrible it was for the people inside this, this, this bottleneck. And so the structure of the event, the structure of the, uh, the physical structure of the event has to be looked at, and they have, to, uh, they have to come up with a better plan for evacuation, a better plan for exiting. It is, um, it, it is, absolutely, it is absolutely crazy that chaos was allowed to reign, that, that chaos can happen like that. Now, accidents happen, and uh, you, can, you can't avoid accidents. If the accidents happen, accidents happen. 
But this was more than an accident. If people slipped on the ramp and fell, uh, that, that, that's fine. It happens. Unfortunately, people slip and they fall all the time. But it shouldn't have caused a domino effect that led to the death of 45 people. There should have been enough room at the front of the line that they weren't crushed against a wall and, 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 and the pressure from being crushed against the wall thrown backwards and crushing everybody else. That should never have happened. People moving forward, people moving backwards, and, and, and everybody getting killed. That should never, ever have happened. Another thing that has to be looked at is how governments treat reports. When inspectors give reports and say that uh, this is a problem, how government, how the government treats those reports. The controllers of the country said that there, there were at least two or three reports indicating that the, it was a dangerous situation at Mount Moron over the last few years. And the government took no action whatsoever to resolve this dangerous situation. Not taking action leads directly to the death of the people uh, last week. So, the government must be held accountable for, for these deaths. They're not doing something about the problem because you're afraid of uh, religious backlash. You're afraid of... Uh, uh, of public opinion going down or whatever political reason they chose not to deal with the problem. Not dealing with the problem makes this more of a, um, I was going to say more of a murder than a uh, than an accidental death um, because when, when, when governments know that there is a problem and the problem could lead to the, to the maiming or death of somebody and don't do something, then they're culpable just like anybody else is. Um, for uh, for for the deaths of these people, well, I wouldn't say murder. I'd say more manslaughter, because they didn't really mean to kill people. They just didn't do anything to avoid it. So, I mean, the government has to be held accountable, and the people who ignored these uh, the, these warnings, the people who ignored these reports that were that were handed in year after year, saying there's a problem and that we have to look at this problem, we have to deal with this problem before somebody gets hurt. People who ignored all that should be held accountable for ignoring it. And I'm not sure if the law allows the families of these victims to sue the government. But if they do, lawsuits should be filed. Somebody has to be held accountable for this. But the government also has to change their system. If warning signs, if warning reports, not even signs, if warning reports come in saying, hey, listen, we have this huge event and there's problems with the huge event, the government has to take it seriously and say, all right. There's problems. Let's go down there. Let's figure out how to fix the problems. They have to do that. Failing to do that, they fail their people. Now, I know I said this before, and you've, you've heard me say this before, that when a government doesn't take care of their people and doesn't watch out for the safety of their people, we talk about this, then they're failing their people. They're not a government. And they shouldn't be considered a government. Government's first job is to take care of their citizens. Now, there's another aspect that I haven't talked about, and I think we're going to look at it for just a couple of seconds now. And uh, it's it's the political aspect of this whole thing. While there are many Arab um, Arab uh, cities, many Arab uh, people living uh, near Mount Moron that came out and tried to help as much as possible, there were Arabs in the country that were celebrating the deaths of these people. Now, this happens after terrorist attacks. This happens. Uh, this happened after this after this event, and is totally unacceptable. And it should be condemned. Every rational person alive, including the uh, I'll use this term very loosely, peace partners, the uh, terrorist Palestinian Authority, they should be condemning this. Instead, they haven't. They refuse to. They even refused to, uh, to, to give condolences for an accident that happened. The Israeli government should take note of this. And I'm not saying revenge, because revenge really doesn't work. 
But what I am saying is that people should be held accountable for their actions. And that's what this whole show has been about, people being held accountable for their actions. We can't just blame this on God and can't just say this was God's will and this is what happened. There were people who, who, who didn't commit actions they should have committed, people who didn't do jobs they should have done, and people who are celebrating the deaths of other people who shouldn't be celebrating. These people should be held accountable for their actions. They should be held accountable for the murder or, or the deaths, excuse me, not the murder. The if we don't hold them accountable, then we're going to see other tragedies like this. Very unfortunate if that happens. But we will see other tragedies. If the system doesn't change, God forbid this may happen again. My heart goes out, my sympathies to the families of the victims. May you be comforted among the mourners of Zion. And may the memories of everybody who died at Mount Moron on Lagbomer be a bl blessing to all of us. I'll see you again next week. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. If you're hearing this message, everyone else can too. Advertise with Israel News Talk Radio and get your message out to people. We'll build a personalized package for you. Contact advertising at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, this is Jake in Anchorage, Alaska, and I love listening to all the super interesting interviews and up-to-date information on what's happening in Israel. Hello, this is Anna King, originally from London, now living in Israel. And what can I say? Israel News Talk Radio is my cup of tea. My name is Bhaskar. I'm from India, and I love listening because you get to know the truth and wonderful voices from this lovely country. Mom! Okay, wait a minute. Hi, this is Chava Dax, and I'm calling for the rolling hills of Malaya Dumim, just north of Jerusalem. I always listen to Israel News Talk Radio to get all the latest news and commentary and to keep me up to date every day. This is Sarah Dax from Malaya Dumim, and I'm 12. I wish Israel News Talk Radio was boring so my mom wouldn't listen to it all the time. Mom! You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.